this might be the first foray about thinking systematically about it. And uh, uh, for uh, there may be others who uh, are here uh, curious about uh, the topic of robotics and architecture. So the presentation, I have structured it to be broad-based and uh, provide an easy introduction into the topic. So I am going to now share my screen with you and uh, go from there. All right, so um, I have uh, titled the uh, presentation as Being Human, Being Robot. How will we dash together? So we can put in any verb in there and uh, it makes it fascinating. How will we live together? How will we work together? How will we interact together? And so on and so forth, because that is at the heart of this topic. Uh, let me also talk about uh, just briefly where I am right now. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, serving as the eighth president of the Boston Architectural College which is a 130 year old institution in uh, Boston. Uh, it is a, in Indian parlance, a deemed university. Uh, and uh, it has been around, uh, uh, as I said, 130 years uh, and offers uh, a number of programs uh, online and on site. Uh, and we were the uh, first in the country and in the world perhaps to offer fully accredited online architecture degree and uh, now we offer many of those. So it's a pioneering place. It's a very innovative place. And uh, it is uh, my pleasure to, uh, to uh, serve in this role here now. So I am uh, going to be talking today uh, about uh, really uh, material drawn from my uh, most recent book towards robotic architecture. But also this is uh, in between my previous book and my next book, which is entitled Being Human, Being Robot. So in that sense, this particular presentation serves uh, to capture some of the themes from the last book and also present ahead of time, some of the themes from the next book. And uh, I know that uh, the book is not as accessible in India, uh, but uh, perhaps Amazon, you can get a hard copy uh, there is an ebook version out there. Uh, it might not yet be accessible in India, but it will be uh, hopefully soon uh, for a very accessible price as well. So uh, that's um, and my co-author Andrew John Witt and I have uh, had pleasure of working with uh, nearly 50 uh, scholars from across the world in putting together this most comprehensive book, uh, and it still continues to be the only comprehensive book on robotics and architecture in the world. So first, uh, let me talk about uh, when we talk about being robot, we inevitably have to talk about being human because it calls into question what it is to be human and then what it is to be a robot because being is at the heart of these two uh, issues. So let me uh, touch uh, a point that uh, existential uh, theorist and a philosopher and writer, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre uh, talked about in, uh, in Nausea. Uh, Sartre talks about, um, and his uh, uh, character Raquantin uh, talks about uh, objects should not touch because they are not alive. You use them, put them back in place. You live among them. They are useful, nothing more, but they touch me. It is unbearable. I'm afraid of being in contact with them as though they are living beasts, as though they were living beasts. And so that's an interesting notion of um, relationship between phenomenal experiences and being human. And of course, in architecture, we work with this, right? We work with the relationship between the built environment, the buildings and ourselves, the spaces and ourselves. And we know that the spaces, the buildings are inert and yet we have a relationship with them. And the same is true with many objects, objects we are fond of, 
objects that remind us of things, objects that are um, commemorative. And uh, it is in that context that I would like to talk about being robot. Now, robotics is uh, undoubtedly one of the technological and perhaps comprehensive uh, revolutions of our time. And uh, we are seeing uh, across the board in virtually all fields, all walks of life, a transformational impact of robotics. And so what is it to be a robot? And uh, how do we wrap our mind around it? How do we understand it? How do we frame it? And that's a question that we pose. So first, let me offer a working definition of robotics, uh, robots. Uh, robots are, uh, there are two elements that are common to all robots. In order for us to call something a robot, it needs to be physical. And that is why I talked about the world of objects, the world of physical beings. And the second thing is autonomy, that uh, robots are autonomous. They have agency, meaning that they can do certain things on their own. And in order to do that, there are three things that are required. The first thing is sensing, that the robots are able to sense their environment, aspects of their environment. They're able to think about it, process it, make sense of it in some way, and then finally act on it in a physical way uh, to alter that environment, to, uh, to change something in the environment. So sensing, thinking, and acting is a cycle, a feedback loop that uh, uh, constitutes uh, really the essential agency of a robot. Now, let's uh, also talk about uh, uh, what is, uh, how do we get into understanding robots? Robots are of, uh, you know, if we talk about interaction uh, between humans and robots, uh, architecture to robots uh, is one way to understand it, where robots are engaging and interacting with buildings and participating in the process of designing the built environment. Second is robot to humans. And uh, third is robots to robots, because robots are going to live in, the in our world, they are going to interact with each other. And finally, the three-way interaction between robots, humans, and architecture, right? So this is a way to frame the interaction aspects of robotics. The um, famous uh, roboticist Rodney Brooks at MIT uh, said something, uh, quite uh, insightful and revolutionary. He said that uh, I am a robot, that I am uh, a complex biological robot. Uh, I, um, I con am constituted by billions and billions of biomolecules which come together and provide me the agency, provide me the sense of self and uh, be able to think and act in this world. And so in that essence, uh, he defined himself as a robot, which is uh, a very important thing to understand, and I will come back to it at the end, uh, but that's uh, a question of how do we empathize together? How do we, uh, how do robots understand us? Because they need to sense uh, how we are thinking and feeling and uh, emoting uh, and acting. And uh, likewise, we have to be able to understand how the robots are thinking acting and responding. So empathy is a very important uh, aspect there. How do we imagine together? As I just mentioned, you know, if you remember, uh, or rather not remember, I sh shouldn't say, because we are talking about uh, the beginnings of, uh, uh, shall we say, the uh, industry, uh, prior to industrial revolution and uh, uh, from René Descartes time, uh, or perhaps even before, uh, let's say go back to the time of clocks when the clocks were invented, uh, people thought the whole universe functioned like a clock, right? We began to define the universe as a clock. And when uh, the computers began to be uh, invented, people thought the whole world is like a computer. And uh, we began to use such things. And now, of course, it is uh, a common part of our language 
to say, well, wait, I am processing. Let me just download this information to myself. Or, um, you know, let me uh, process in the, and provide feedback. Uh, you know, all of these kinds of input, output, all of these terms uh, emerge from the paradigm, the age of computers, the age of uh, information systems. And then we began to now with the advent of robots uh, and robotics, there is a worldview that is emerging where we begin to define ourselves as Rodney Brooks just did, uh, perhaps as robots. But it, by doing so, we are also imagining the robots to be human and uh, to some extent or the other. And so Victor's Robotus is a, is, uh, is a life form, right? And so one of the definitions that I would offer here is that um, robots, by virtue of their formal existence, uh, have a certain um, uh, relationship. And uh, there are four categories of understanding robots by their form. Uh, and their form determines how we relate to them. First thing is biomorphic meaning that the robots that resemble biological organisms. Uh, second is mechanomorphic. Uh, they look like what we think are machines, such as drones or uh, you know, tanks or airplanes, automobiles. These are all machines. And robots that are in that form are, uh, are all called uh, mechanomorphic robots. Polymorphic robots, uh, they change form. And so if you've seen the movie Transformers or Interstellar, you would know the polymorphic robots. And finally, amorphic robots are the ones which are physical, but they don't have any particularly defined form, but they are physical. And it is very difficult to uh, understand them through the formal aspect because they are amorphous. Uh, and the biomorphic is where the human form is implicated as well as animal forms. Uh, and so humanoids are, or zooid robots in general are uh, in that particular category. Now, these categories are simply defined by form, but not by their capability, not by their ability to have computational processing power, none of those. It is just purely by virtue of form. And uh, that is why we go back to Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, notion of rock uh, the objects have the power to touch us, that uh, we need to relate. We, we have no way other than to relate to them as living beings to a certain extent. So now let's just take a look at a, a range of robotic applications and how we connect with them. In this case, it is a robotic mop, a robot, uh, how we clean together, right? And or how we sanitize together is becoming now a pretty uh, uh, widely used in uh, hospitals in their post-COVID times, uh, how we care together. In this case, it is a robot called Alice, uh, which works with uh, uh, special needs uh, children and uh, children with autism uh, to be able to interact with them in ways that humans might find it difficult to interact with. And yet uh, the robots are able to do so by virtue of their form. Right, it's a humanoid form. It is not the computational capacity, but rather the form of this robot that makes a difference. And in this case, it is uh, how we socialize together. This is Alfie, uh, the elder care robot, where uh, it can uh, work with uh, elders uh, to memorize certain things, remember certain locations, remember, uh, remind uh, the uh, people to take medicine on time or a number of other uh, things, but most importantly, to socialize, right? to provide the other when the others uh, might not be as accessible or available, but it does fulfill that social role and hence the uh, entire field of social robotics. And how we drive together, as we already know, the self-driving robots, uh, automobiles are really robots. We sit in the robot, and the robot uh, gets us from point A to point B uh, by really thinking and uh, understanding the context and uh, uh, interpreting the uh, where we want to go and so on. Uh, although the automobiles have still some distance to go, no pun intended, 
uh, they are at least in concept here and already being implemented uh, in uh, some conceptual and or actually proof of concept stage uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, highway trucking uh, industry is developing around uh, robotic uh, vehicles. And we already know the drones. Uh, so drones uh, are really possible, made possible because of the robotic technologies. And uh, drones have transformed how we see the world, how we connect with the world visually, geographically, right? Uh, we know how many movies lately feature uh, robotic drone shots from up above moving, a way of viewing that was not possible quite before. All the people were using helicopters, but uh, the agency of using a helicopter to provide that kind of vantage point is very limited. Whereas with robots, uh, we are able to do a number of things of our relationship to the land and the landscape uh, and the geography in general has been transformed through robotics. In this case, I just wanted to show you very unusual drones. These are jet drones, drones that are powered by jets uh, as opposed to, uh, shall we say, uh, propellers and other mechanisms of uh, providing lift. Uh, how we remote sense together. Now, uh, as climate change becomes um, a more and more critical issue, our ability to understand our planet's health is very important. And uh, one of the aspects of understanding our planet's health is sensing and remote sensing, where humans either cannot go or be for a very long time uh, in order to take measurements or to take real-time measurements in the most remote locations possible uh, in order to build a better sense of the planetary conditions and health. So in this case, uh, it is a submersible uh, uh, robot which can operate on its own, be able to gather data and be able to transmit it remotely uh, and does extend our ability to understand and intervene better uh, in our planet's um, life. How we shop together. This is a, a so-called cargo robot. And these are personal assistant robots, uh, which uh, can follow you and uh, can carry the cargo uh, either with you or all by themselves, uh, take cargo from point A to point B uh, and these are also called delivery robots. So we, uh, of course, uh, in the US and in Europe, uh, there are already a number of uh, pilot projects uh, and or actual applications of um, cargo robots. They deliver food, they deliver goods, uh, they provide the last mile support in uh, some of the supply chain mechanisms, uh, operations and systems. So this is becoming a very interesting proposition. And of course, we already know uh, the production robots in the industrial production uh, where we produce together, right? So how humans and robots work together to produce industrial um, products is a very interesting proposition. And how we heal together is also a robotic collaboration. With the advent of uh, such uh, machines as uh, robots as uh, da Vinci, in this case, uh, this is a high precision surgical robot, which allows for doctors to operate with a level of precision and accuracy that was not possible before. And thus, it uh, literally opens up uh, new ways of healing, new ways of intervening surgically and medically. And there is a whole slew of uh, uh, they call them thermostats, but really these are nothing but robotic agencies. Uh, this is a Nest thermostat, in, and uh, if you utilize Nest thermostat or any other AI-based thermostats, they transform homes and the heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems into robotic agencies. They sense their environment, they process them, they understand, they make sense of what are the patterns and uh, they're able to operate the machinery in ways that transforms them into robotic environments. Or how we explore together. Uh, in this case, uh, Mars happens to be the only planet in our solar system and perhaps anywhere in the known universe 
where the entire planet is inhabited by just one life form called robots. So Mars happens to be the first planet entirely inhabited by robots. And we cannot reach Mars without robots. So in fact, uh, the, the whole uh, vision of being able to colonize Mars, to travel to Mars, is made possible because of robotics. Without that, uh, in the previous decades, we could not have done it. Or how we govern together. In this case, uh, this is a political robot uh, called uh, Sophia. Uh, Sophia was uh, introduced in 2017 and also given citizenship in certain countries. Uh, and uh, is uh, now, if you look at it, this is not necessarily the most uh, sophisticated computational mechanism, but it is a most sophisticated presentation of uh, uh, computational mechanisms in human form. And that is why form of robots is so important. So Sophia has made a lot of waves and uh, has opened up um, uh, an understanding about uh, governance and politics that uh, is quite phenomenal. Now, moving a little more into architecture, what is the role of robotics in architecture? We define it four ways. One is, uh, you know, in the design process, uh, robotics can uh, inform observationally or in the prototyping process, conceptualization process. And the second is fabrication where robots are used uh, for either very customized or uh, mass uh, produced uh, mechanism, uh, uh, a variety of manufacturing uh, possible off site. And the construction robots are about robots employed on the construction site in the construction process alongside human workers and operators. And uh, finally, operational robots where either components or entire buildings are transformed into robotic mechanisms. So those are the four ways robotics play a role in architecture alone. Now, let me get into a few of these aspects in robotics, in architecture. The first thing is how we make together, right? So making is part of the, one of the fundamental elements of uh, uh, how we uh, intervene through architecture. So, uh, how we make. In this case, the robots are more than mere instrumental agencies, by which I mean that um, if you take a drill, if you take uh, a screwdriver, or if you take uh, a hammer, these are all tools, these are all instruments. They have no agency on their own, right? So there is a certain instrumentality to it that we can use them, otherwise they are not used. Whereas with robots, robots have agency all by themselves. They're able to operate autonomously uh, to many aspects. So either you have um, uh, tele-operated robots where you are just simply remote controlling or all the way to the other end where you have fully autonomous robots who are able to entirely be on their own uh, without a human intervention, be able to accomplish tasks, actually set themselves goals and accomplish those goals. So goal setting, goal accomplishment, all of those are possible in the fully autonomous mode or in the teleoperated mode, it is remote control. So in between, we got a great range of agency and autonomy that um, uh, with which these robots can function. So they become more partners rather than mere instruments. They're not mere tools. That is the most important. Uh, in this case, the robot is able to work with a human worker. The human worker is drawing a line on the floor and the robot is going to follow that and be able to do certain tasks based on that. So you're able to work visually. In this uh, case, uh, by attaching a bandsaw at the end of the robot. So we call that the end effectors, right? So the robotic arm is really nothing but a three-dimensional positioning mechanism that gives multiple degrees of freedom of positioning in three-dimensional space, but actually also accomplishing things obviously four-dimensionally, meaning that it is not merely just positioning one point, but actually moving from one point all the way to another point in three-dimensional space through a complex path, right? So 
uh, you can attach anything at the end of it. And those are called end effectors. And the end effectors will be able to accomplish certain things. So that's, um, that's one of the, uh, uh, so one of the things. And um, so uh, in this case, the bandsaw is able to follow the contours of a certain uh, grain and uh, along the lines of the grain in a, a particular uh, piece of wood and be able to do very sophisticated fabrication operations. That was not possible before. Uh, and let's go to the next one. In this case, it is a foam cutting robot where you attach the end effector that cuts a foam and you're able to accomplish things like this. So this is done by a couple of friends across from my institution at MIT where uh, they basically, this is a foam tower. And uh, foam tower was done using that particular process of foam cutting, right? So you were able to accomplish things like this, make objects and environments that were not possible before. Uh, in this case, in uh, this is 3D, it's a very ingenious molten metal 3D printing in uh, free space. So this is actually creating metallic uh, elements in three-dimensional space uh, through a process of 3D uh, printing and deposition of this metal in 3D space. So uh, you'll be amazed to see the application of this. With this, things like this are becoming possible, right? So that was uh, it's called a dragon bench uh, produced by uh, a Dutch uh, artists, uh, uh, Joris Larman and, uh, and MX3D. So they have produced uh, uh, you know, furniture like this. They have also done uh, self-constructing bridges like this by actually integrating the ability to make into the objects. So in a way, it is the objects are making themselves, right? So robots become part of the structure. Robots become part of the making of the structure. And then robots become part of the operation of the structure. So in that sense, this is what we might call autopoiesis of making itself, which is one of the aspects of living beings. And in this case, it is a, 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 a formal, a moldless free forming uh, method uh, that was developed by uh, a researcher in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, and in this, uh, let me show you. So this is, um, uh, it's a metal sheet metal forming uh, using two robots working in tandem, but also a sensing mechanism. So the way it works is you sense, these are all uh, common with the uh, anisotropic materials where there is variability within the material, such as sheet metal. So sheet metal is not homogenous. It, is, uh, uh, it has variability throughout, right? So when you, when you want to do something with sheet metal, it may respond differently in different points on that surface because of the material variations. What this robot does, the robotic system does, is look for those material variations and provide uh, the kind of uh, impact and responsiveness that will then mold it. So this is uh, molding sheet metal without the molds. Uh, so that's what is uh, fascinating about it. And with that, these kinds of structures are made possible where you are uh, integrating certain structural capabilities into uh, the uh, sheet metal and be able to produce uh, structures of this nature. Another example, uh, in England um, at uh, Architectural Association, they uh, took a robot into the middle of a forest in Southwest England and uh, they 3D scanned uh, 204 trees. Uh, and then from those 3D scans, they selected about 25 trees to be harvested. Uh, these are basically forking trees that will have some structural capabilities. And by making sense of those, they were able to build this structure uh, from those 25 trees. So computationally, they were able to construct this and they were able to robotically make it uh, at the same time. And so those, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, uh, you know, my friends uh, in Switzerland, uh, Gramazio Kohler and uh, Raffaello uh, D'Andrea, they have um, uh, a fascinating uh, 
uh, airborne uh, robotics and uh, and construction methods. So let me just go ahead and play. So um, using the methods like this, as well as in this case, um, uh, researchers and uh, my collaborators in, um, uh, in Germany at ICD Stuttgart, uh, they uh, have been working with uh, carbon uh, fibers and be able to weave them and to produce the lightest possible structures, uh, such as this one, and uh, <clears throat> be able to robotically produce them for uh, researchers in Portugal, where they are exploring construction site scale robotics. In this case, uh, it's called a spider bot that uh, is able to essentially replace construction crane or transform that into an entirely new set of possibilities. So these are um, being explored. And um, um, another uh, collaborator in New York, um, uh, Mike Silver, has been working with robotic masons and uh, how robotic masons can work with humans. Uh, be able to collaborate. So in this case, uh, there is so much of interaction involved between the world, humans, and robots, right? So this is a three-way interaction that um, defines this era of robotics. Now, let me also talk about how robotic architecture framework uh, intersects with the building. So at a building, if you just purely look at the buildings, and say, what is going to be the application of robotics? First thing is robotic components, which means that buildings may have certain components that are robotic. They can be robotic blinds, robotic skins, uh, robotic uh, you know, ceilings, or so on. Second is robotic systems, uh, such as building services and systems. And third thing is structures, where structures themselves might become robotic or uh, the entire buildings can be uh, robotic, which is a far-fetched possibility, but nevertheless a possibility at certain scales and has already been experimented with. So this is one of the building scale robotic applications. So this is North Carolina State University uh, book bot. Uh, it's a library. And uh, to give you the scale, you see the circle at the center top, the red circle, that actually highlights the human being who is in that far corner of the building. That is a human scale, and that is how big this particular robot is. So this is a multi-storied robot, and uh, it is entirely automated um, and autonomous uh, a robot uh, that uh, is a building scale application. So in case you are wondering, when will we see building scale applications? It's already being done, and there are many robotic libraries already in usage all over the world. In this case, it is a, a robotic structure uh, that is being uh, experimented by one of my uh, friends, Axel Killian, uh, who is currently at MIT, and is working on installation of a flexing room uh, where it can robotically flex based on certain conditions and requirements and needs. So these are. Uh, some possibilities we can look to. Or how we dwell together uh, in this event, uh, this, these are works by uh, artist and architect uh, and roboticist uh, uh, Philip Beasley, who is working with um, uh, extraordinary environments that interact and he calls them primitive life forms uh, that uh, allow us to live and dwell in it. So let me go to another application. Now it is at a human body scale, how robotics become part of the human body. And, uh, and that uh, it is not just somehow robots are the other. It's not robots are outside of us. Robots are away from us. Robots are the other. 
it is actually not those, but rather that robots are part of us. They may become part of the human body, and this is an example, and I'm gonna give you a couple of examples in that, where the scale shifts. So this uh, project called The Keras of the Gaze by uh, artist and roboticist uh, Bainaz Farahi in California, uh, she has been working with these uh, wearable robots uh, that would be responsive and also transform the kind of environment and uh, interaction between the environment us and through the gendered form. So this is what is fascinating about here is how robots begin to alter uh, the way we relate to each other as human beings through the gendered forms and norms. Another example. So there a completely paralyzed uh, uh, paraplegic patient uh, was given uh, the ability to kick a football, the ability to walk uh, using robotic agencies. So this is another way robotic agencies become part of the human body and uh, provide, transform us into, and then you begin to question where does human begin or human end and the robot begin and how it becomes a new way uh, uh, of defining being human. So um, you think uh, if you think uh, robots are there are certain parts of the society that are immune to the uh, shall we say seduction of or the power of the robotics, uh, think again. So in this case, there's a, a robot called uh, Bless You Too, and uh, Bless You Too is a robot that can bless you in multiple languages. Uh, and this was, uh, you know, done as an artistic installation, uh, you know, made a lot of waves. But this was not the first robot that is a religious robot, if you will. But the, that credit goes to this tiny little robot called uh, Shianer, uh, who is um, a devotee or uh, the apprentice of Master Xian Fan. Uh, and uh, it's in Longchan Buddhist Temple in the outskirts of Beijing, where the... Um, Robot can, um, uh, she and her can actually recite uh, certain Buddhist uh, uh, teachings and uh, be able to uh, provide interaction at that level, right? So uh, another uh, is another example is the Aibo uh, dog robots, robotic dogs. Uh, in Japan, they uh, the owners of these dogs, robotic dogs have such have developed such affinity for them that they held a funeral for the dead robot dogs. Uh, you begin to see how now clearly the, it, we don't do this uh, funeral for, uh, I don't know, cars or funeral for spoons, or funeral for your phones. None of those happen. But in this case, because of the form of the robot and the interaction with the humans and the relationships that they are able to establish, we have that affinity and thus it transforms the sociology and anthropology of being human, being robot. And there are three rules that Isaac Asimov proposed that robots must follow. Uh, one is that a robot may not injure a human being. Second is that they, may, they must obey the orders given by human beings. 
except when it is in conflict, the first one. And the third one is that uh, it must, uh, uh, you know, uh, it must not be protecting its own existence. Uh, uh, it will protect its own existence only in so far as it does not conflict with the first two rules. However, what we are seeing is that those rules have already been broken. And in this case, this is a robotic drone uh, weapon that we all are familiar with, how that is transforming the battlefields and um, warfare uh, through robotic agencies oh, well, who are like this. Open the pod bay doors, Ben. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about? This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. So this is uh, the famous movie 2001 A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick. And uh, this robot uh, ship is called uh, HAL. Uh, and uh, uh, HAL uh, begins to uh, work against the human. So again, the, the notion and the fears that we have about robots have already been laid out uh, in these kinds of uh, fictional uh, literary as well as uh, cinematic uh, expositions that we are familiar with. So how we argue together is also an important aspect of uh, working with understanding robots. And um, so then it follows a natural question is, are there, uh, is a, there is in fact a field called roboethics where how we treat robots is very important, just as how we treat each other as humans uh, because of the potential for them to alter uh, our ability to relate with them and with each other. So um, here we are at the uh, dawn of uh, fourth industrial revolution, it has been called with robotics and AI, uh, artificial intelligence combined, we call it the fourth industrial revolution. And it is already here. It is already transforming the world. Some of these are visible, some of these are invisible. And nevertheless, the cross-sectional elements of uh, robotics and AI transforming our world uh, is a very real phenomenon uh, by any means. And uh, we are going to see more of it. And when we think about it, if we move past the fears about robots, robotics, and AI, and we really understand that uh, we are confronting a new uh, age in the human existence where our planetary uh, uh, planetary scale problems, climate change, or for that matter, uh, phenomena such as um, globalized movements, human movements, and uh, inequalities, all of these are the real problems where uh, we cannot look to the past for solutions because it is the past paradigms that have created the kind of problems we are living with today. And if we try to solve those problems of the past, from the past with modalities of the past, then we are essentially asking a futile question of uh, how can we, right? If the wisdom lived in the past, uh, then uh, it is not going to be able to solve the paradigms that created those problems in the first place. So what are the new paradigms that open up new opportunities, new ways of thinking, understanding ourselves, our world, and our ability to work with our world, uh, to transform it, and uh, but at the same time, take a very uh, a humble approach to create a more humane world with uh, the partnership, through the partnership with robotic agencies, with robots. So, with that, I would like to um, offer this summation that how will we, and then we can put any number of uh, verbs in there, are going to be uh, the questions we're going to ask ourselves. Uh, so ultimately, how will we work together? How will we live together? How will we dwell together? 
and, uh, and learn together? How will we uh, make and target and work and worship together? So these are the questions that will dominate uh, uh, our future. So thank you. And I'm going to stop the screen share so that uh, we can discuss. And I'm happy to go back to any of these and uh, uh, let me see. I know that there are some questions that have already been posed. So let me get into it right away. Uh, the first question was um, from Praveen. Uh, can we call automation as robots, robotics? No, they are not. Uh, automation is a broad umbrella and robotics is a subset of it. So robotic automation is a subset of general automation. So automation obviously has been around for a very long time, but robotic automation uh, where autonomy, which is different from automation. Autonomy means the ability to operate on their own to the extent of goal setting, goal seeking, and the ability to solve all of those have been made possible. So any other um, questions, please feel free to chat or uh, uh, the moderator uh, could uh, moderate the discussion. Yes, anyone? Uh... Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Okay, question. Uh, like uh, with respect to, to the energy uh, auditing or energy efficiency of any building, uh, when we are talking about the performance of the building, so yes. do we have uh, uh, an applications or uh, uh, maybe robotic or non-robotic applications which can autonomously actually yep. uh, uh, see what is happening with respect to a building and then the, give us some yeah. more information on how to improve the efficiency. Absolutely, yes. Um, Sunil, good question. And uh, yes, there are already systems and I had shown one of them. If we're looking at a domestic scale where homes can be automated using uh, such uh, robotic devices as uh, uh, AI driven uh, thermostats. So artificial intelligence is essentially the agency that is transforming the ability to sense patterns, ability to sense the uh, usage, the consumption, and optimize the usage. All of these questions are being asked and uh, at a building scale, right? So at um, very large complexes now uh, deploying these uh, auto uh, autonomous AI-driven uh, performance management systems. So it, th those are in existence. I think uh, they will become more common. There is also another aspect of it, which is the ability to utilize robots that are able to rogue around in space, be able to gather real-time information of various kinds that cannot otherwise be sent. So we may have uh, certain robots that would be going around the buildings, actually uh, trying to understand how the building performance is and better manage those, so those applications uh, do exist, so many possibilities, but it's uh, in a nascent uh, stage. Certainly, more applications can be explored. In the construction management, I have heard about the application of uh, drones in actually uh, taking pictures and then uh, uh, collecting evidence, corroborating the evidence, yeah. and uh, yeah. all that is happening. So in, even yeah. in building performance, like as you have uh, just yeah. said, so maybe those uh, uh, nascent steps, whatever it is, I think we should explore on them, all, yeah. all of us, and to see that they become more uh, uh, <coughs> common so that uh, yeah. the building performances would improve very drastically. Yes, that is so true. And in fact, uh, that's a good point. And certainly things are moving in that direction. Drones are already being employed in construction sites, in understanding uh, existing sites, historic preservation, uh, conservation applications, uh, documentation. So there are just a host of things opened up by that direction. Now, there is a question about um, a couple of questions. Uh, what are the prerequisites for higher studies in digital architecture and robotics? Uh, really, just simply that you have an architecture degree. <laughs> so if you got that, you can certainly explore it in your master's uh, in a variety of places around the world, including at the Boston Architecture College. 
Next question is, can you tell us about robotic fabrication? And I think uh, this section on robotic fabrication in the book, uh, the whole book has about 70% of the book um, towards robotic architecture is about robotic fabrication. Uh, and so there's a lot happening and a lot can be said about it. Do I suggest this to be part of the academics or bachelor's degree uh, or is it too early? Nothing is too early. Yes, we already integrate that into the undergraduate studies in, uh, at our institution. We, for example, work with Autodesk's uh, robotic uh, lab, uh, which is in Boston. So we offer certain classes uh, in collaboration with them. So that is being taken by undergraduate students, but also postgraduate students. Do you think India is ready? Well, India is not only ready, but actually India has been quite uh, well ahead in certain aspects of robotic applications, which you may not see. For instance, uh, in India, the agricultural applications of uh, robotic remote sensing uh, using drones and be able to actually manage uh, weed management, uh, soil management, and uh, crop management in general has already been advanced. So there are organizations in India doing a lot of research on that. I mean, it's mind bogglingly vast. So uh, yes, the answer is simply yes. And you, in fact, the, uh, there are uh, areas in Africa which are not as accessible, but uh, using drones, uh, they're able to deliver medicines and supplies uh, or able to monitor certain aspects of uh, Amazon, uh, you know, remote jungle areas. So same in India, these are all very possible and already being explored. What is the scope in the urban planning? Like, uh, are there any uh, studies happening or projects uh, happening in uh, urban yeah. planning level? Absolutely, yes. Uh, at urban planning level, really, we are looking at um, predominantly transportation aspects of it how the transportation industry is going to transform, what are the impacts of that? Is it going to obviate uh, issues of parking, issues of uh, uh, the uh, kinds of roads we would build, the kinds of systems and infrastructure we need to mobilize, uh, how that is going to transform, how people move around, how the traffic issues are going to be impacted, how the pollution is going to be impacted, all of these aspects at urban planning scale uh, including uh, such things as uh, is uh, the robotic drone personal transportation where people can be moved around like Bangalore or Delhi or even Hyderabad where uh, there, there have been some applications that uh, are being explored for uh, first from transportation side, second from energy management side yes. where uh, you know, artificial intelligence being infused and uh, being able to manage energy at a city scale. How do you move around uh, the supply and demand based on demand, understanding the patterns of usage. So there are applications from the artificial intelligence aspect of it. Uh, sir, Professor Mohan, sir, you can uh, uh, unmute and ask your question, sir. Uh, the driverless cars, these come under, uh, these are robots? Yes. Yeah. So I, I had a chance to, uh, you know, go in a driverless car in Abu Dhabi. So uh, I have one question here, like uh, how does the car uh, deal with issues that are ethical? For example, uh, you know, like uh, suppose I'm going in a driverless car, and in front of the car, uh, let's say it's uh, crossing a, a school zone and uh, around, let's say five children are uh, passing the car. And you know, the uh, car uh, has to take a decision. Uh, it might have to, um, you know, change its direction. And then in front, there might be a tree. So it might go and hit the tree. So now uh, if it hits the tree, then the uh, owner or the driver, person inside the car will die. Um, uh, if it hits the children, the, all these five children will die. So now what type of decision will the uh, robot take? Will it kill the owner or will it kill the uh, children? 
hopefully it will hit the break, but uh, I think your question goes to the heart of robotic ethics that I was hinting at, Professor Mohan. And uh, first, I'm glad to hear you were able to experience uh, uh, an autonomous vehicle. And um, it can be unsettling experience, I would imagine. But it is also unsettling uh, for the reasons you've explained very well, which is uh, the ethical questions that were either subliminal or tacit before have now become very active questions. Uh, and the whole aspect of law, ethics, uh, and uh, decision making is one aspect of uh, robotics that um, is a field of its own, right? So there are no easy answers to these kinds of questions because uh, you know we are talking about culpability. Uh, you know where do you assign blame and responsibility? We're talking about um, what are the safety systems? What are the levels of safety? And uh, we usually set a bar higher for robots than for humans. For example, if a human driver uh, makes a decision and uh, you know, kills a number of people, uh, that is seen as one. But if a robot does same thing, it would be seen as entirely differently. And that is true actually. In fact, uh, a number of accidents that uh, robotic automobiles have been involved in were because people were actively uh, and curiously intervening with these systems and uh, kicking them, cutting them off, or doing a number of things to it because those are autonomous vehicles and or provoking them in some ways. These are behaviors that the robots have to anticipate in the future and be able to respond to. But also understanding the norms human norms, which is a very difficult thing for a robot to do. So those are the barriers of advances in uh, robotic applications, particularly in transportation sector, as you pointed out. Thank you. Uh, so there was one question uh, asking about the tools which we use in robotics architecture. Well, I mean, as I already shown you, there is actually a vast number. There is, in fact, an infinite number of tools you can employ with uh, robotic architecture because if you're talking about just simply the industrial robotics aspect of it, and I'm not even talking about drones, not talking about uh, humanoid robots uh, like robotic masons, we are just simply talking about industrial articulated arm robots. You can attach anything at the end of it, you can attach a camera. You can attach a phone, you can attach a knife, you can attach a drill, you can attach any tool that you can think of. So it is a, um, a transformational capacity it gives us to work with any tool that transforms that into a robotic tool. Uh, so I have a question actually. Uh, Please. So uh, today morning, Mohan sir was giving one lecture on disaster uh, uh, resilient uh, landscaping. Uh, that was the topic. But uh, when uh, during uh, disaster or after immediately after disaster, uh, so can we use uh, these robots to actually survey the area and try to know what exactly is the degree of uh, uh, damage, damage, damage yeah. and uh, issue? Yeah. The, the uh, Mohan sir was. Uh, yeah, telling us that the, the first one hour is the golden hour of a disaster wherein we can actually should be able to collect a lot of information so that we can uh, actually uh, the next level of management, disaster management would be, uh, it can base uh, these information. So uh, uh, this might be a potential place for the robots. So, yes, actually, in fact, uh, uh, disaster management was the first area where robotics began to be developed. The reason was uh, originally robots were able to do a couple of things. Uh, you know, they, they all start with the D, like disasters or dull or uh, um, hazardous situations where they can do things. So that is in fact uh, where the militaries use them and disaster management agencies use them. So uh, in fact, that's the origin of it, of okay. some of these applications. Are there any examples from the US, like uh, when they have faced these cyclones and uh, uh, 
so did uh, did they do this? So yes, and um, uh, a lot of uh, reconnaissance uh, applications of robotics in disaster management. That is one. Second is the ability to go and, for instance, let's say in, in case of earthquakes, uh, there have been applications where robots could go where humans could not go safely. Yes. So they'll be able to go see. They'll be able to actually use either infrared or motion sensing or a variety of other sensors to be able to sense anybody living there uh, under the uh, you know rubble and so on and so forth. So yes, that those are actively used. Uh, sir, in US or any other place, are there any uh, funding agencies that would encourage research in robotics? Of course. Um, yes, Hema. And uh, there are, um, I mean, I, there are many. In fact, um, you know, NSF, National Science Foundation, or a uh, number of other agencies, uh, US Department of uh, Defense, uh, they all fund actually robotic applications nowadays. Of course, every Funding agency is funding robotic applications, including education, mm -hmm. where what are the education applications of robotics? Mm -hmm. uh, robotic uh, teaching, robotic, uh, you know, ways of intervening. Uh, for instance, uh, some students who uh, either uh, are allergic, have underlying conditions, cannot go to class, then uh, there are robots, telepresence robots that represent them, that the kids, the children can operate from their home, but be present through the robot in the class physically, right? So those are all kinds of applications or so education applications uh, that are being funded by education related agencies. And funding is plenty. And so is with uh, private research, entrepreneurial startups being funded with venture capital or angel capital and so on. So there, there's plenty of uh, opportunity. Okay. Uh, sir, are there any other questions or uh, can we close the session? We, uh, we would like to take a photograph, sir, uh, with the whole group. Uh, before leaving. That'd be great. <laughs> uh, one last question, uh, Hema. Yes, uh, are robots going to replace the teachers? <laughs> <laughs> like in India, one uh, school, uh, uh, you know, they, the main teacher uh, takes the class and the other uh, assistant teachers, like... Uh, a robo uh, wearing a sari, uh, they are using that. So that robot takes the attendance. And then uh, today, for example, uh, in the online class, the robo can make the breakout rooms and then uh, do all these other activities that uh, a junior teacher may be doing. And uh, this is happening in a school. Uh, so do you think that uh, soon in architecture colleges, the main design teacher will be taking and the other uh, uh, maybe two, three uh, junior teachers can be replaced by a robot. <laughs> I think uh, I would say more senior teachers probably can. <laughs> I'm just joking, but uh, I think uh, we will we will see uh, a possibility where we would be collaborating with robots in the teaching environments. That is definitely possible. And um, uh, I used to experiment with uh, a telepresence robot in uh, in. Uh, in design studio reviews, for instance. So I did a few of those. Uh, there are possibilities. Now, in fact, with the COVID times, it's becoming even more applicable where uh, we may have avatars present through the physical robotic avatars uh, that are able to uh, play a role. But I, I would say it is still in a nascent uh, stage in the higher education world. There is a lot of work in the uh, uh, primary and secondary education. Yeah. <clears throat> definitely nothing can replace a teacher. <laughs> yeah, I would definitely agree with you that uh, teacher has, um, you know, if we go to the uh, origin of the word teacher, the Sanskrit root of it, which goes to the dik, which is the direction. And yes. pointing to the direction is a teacher. So, and education as bringing out the best, Ida is to bring out the best, right? So following those, education is an activity that is a fundamentally human activity of uh, eliciting and drawing out the best from within. Uh, so 
robots play a role as we saw in the religious robots case where they are playing a certain role sure there is there is room for that so oh, great yeah. uh, can we uh, proceed for the photograph uh, one last yes, uh, yes sir uh, can robots uh, i think it would be better to use robots for evaluating the answer scripts because um, yes. Uh, you know, like human beings uh, are emotional. Uh, they may like a particular teacher and give a student a gift. Student. But a robot <laughs> won't have any emotions. <laughs> I agree. And I think actually there are already applications, as you suggested, uh, in existence in uh, processing that. Artificial intelligence aspect yeah. plays out. Okay, uh, all the participants, please turn on your uh, uh, cameras for a quick photograph. Okay, page two is populating. The page one is done here, my Yes. We have still 15 more. Okay. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, great to see you all, and uh, I hope uh, we'll meet in person at some point of time. Yes, sir. to you all, and uh, uh, I wish you all the best, and uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you so much for the session, sir. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your business schedule doing this for us. Thank my you. My pleasure. My yes. pleasure. And my thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Mahesh. It was a very uh, crisp and uh, very informative uh, uh, session. Uh, the way you have actually introduced the architects about robots. And I'm, uh, I'm sure that many of us have uh, now a better understanding of what a robot is, uh, the way you divided them into four, and the way that happens between the robo and human, the interaction, the possibilities of all the interactions that you have elucidated. There might be still more, many, that we have to actually pursue our, as a uh, from now on, so I think definitely, uh, and I think this this should be a presentation for all the students of architecture. We should uh, actually do this for all the students of architecture. I'm happy Thank you so much. Thank you so much for you. taking your time for us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, thank you all the participants. We'll uh, meet again in tomorrow's session. Thank you. Sir, thank you, sir, Mohan, sir, for your questions and you sharing your experience of autonomous car. And that was a very tricky question. Maybe any robotic uh, person will be hesitant to answer, <laughs> but definitely uh, the, the, first, the three rules uh, that Mahesh was speaking, maybe there might be some answers from those three rules. And uh, there is one more thing, you know, like uh, uh, just just like any other system, like say, for example, you have a computer and uh, there are hackers, there are hackers and uh, yes, and all that. So mm -hmm. in these robotic systems also, uh, uh, you know, people uh, you see in machine learning, they'll be feeding them with a lot of information. Information, yes. Intentionally, they will feed, feed wrong information. So mm -hmm. then the robot becomes biased. You know, yes. and it takes wrong decisions. So yes, there is a danger. You know, uh, you know there are good people, there are bad people also. So, uh, you know, the robots can be robots can be made uh, for unethical use also. Yes, then sir. the problems start. Yes, yes. Sir. <laughs> it is the people, not the robots, that we are having problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night.